All right, so I just want to start off this morning with just a little background information. Uh, so what is a cover crop? Basically just, you know, hope this is pretty much review for a lot of people. Just a crop that we grow. Um, we want a living ground cover. Um, we're gonna plant that either between rows or between crops, either before or after uh, a main cash crop. Again, our main goal is to have that living root in the ground as many days of the year as possible. You know, organic matter and uh, microbial activity and all those types of things that go along with that. So here's, when we're thinking about cover crops, here's just some of the benefits. You know, there's many benefits associated with having cover crops in the system. You know, the big buzzword is the soil health. You know, that falls into things like aggregation and that's aeration and infiltration. You know, the organic matter content, biological <coughs> activity that goes along with that, uh, having that organic matter in the system. Improved soil fertility. A lot of these crops will scavenge nutrients. A lot of the grasses, fairly deep in the system, can scavenge nutri nutrients and bring those up in the top part of the soil profile. Uh, we have plants like the legumes that fix the nitrogen and add nutrients back to the system. And all of these things impact that overall nutrient cycle. Can in increase subsequent uh, yields of those cash crops. Uh, having that litter on the soil surface can prevent soil erosion, conserve soil moisture, uh, protects that water quality, reducing the runoff. All those types of things provides habitat for beneficial insects, and then at the bottom there, it can suppress, control weeds and pathogens, nematodes, and those types of things in the system as well. Certain crops can do that. But my main interest when this whole thing came out about cover crops is like, wow! When you start looking at the list of what people are using for a cover crop, the majority of those are good forage crops. So you know this integration of livestock in with these cover crops, getting this dual purpose, hopefully getting <coughs> most of those benefits that I just listed on that previous slide, along with uh, feeding your animals. You know, there's kind of a win-win situation in my <coughs> opinion. Uh, one thing to realize when we're dealing with the livestock is you know, about 90% of what goes in the front end comes out the back end of the cow. And um, you know, there's not all of that's available. You know, the ammonia in the urine is going to be volatilized. Um, you know, it has to go through the nutrient mineral cycle, become available for plants, those types of things. There is concentration of the nutrients in those dung and urine spots. Uh, so the use of rotational strip grazing approach when we're grazing these cover crops can help to you know, minimize that concentration around the water tanks and, and some of those types of things. To me, one of the biggest drawbacks of having animals out there in a the cropping system is this potential for soil compaction, especially on some of our heavier uh, textured uh, type soils. Uh, another drawback is infrastructure, uh, but a lot of that can be taken care of. You know, fences and water. Uh, there's a plethora of you know uh, electric fencing type options out there. Temporary electric fencing options that uh, can be easily set up. Uh, movable water tanks. Uh, water, you know, hauling water uh, on a temporary basis. Because a lot of these, <coughs> grazing these, we're maybe only talking 30 days, 45 days, maybe a couple of months at a time. So we're not talking a long period of time that we'll have animals in a given area. Some of the potential species, these are just kind of general categories here. Your cool season annual grasses, things like triticale, wheat, and oats, and rye, and some of those. Uh, Annual ryegrass is one that we don't use a whole lot in uh, this part of the country, but I think it's one that has a lot of potential uh, for use. Uh, some of your warm season annual grasses, your millets, uh, forage sorghum, sorghum sedan, uh, your hybrids, uh, corn, tap, all of those would fall into that category. Lots of biomass production from those. Uh, the brassicas are one thing I'm going to talk about today. I'm really interested in those, your mustard type crops. Swedes or rutabagas, turnips, grapes, kale, canola, radishes, and there's a whole bunch of different hybrids out there. Turnip, grape hybrids, and different ones. Uh, your legumes, um, eel peas work really well. You have uh, both winter and spring type varieties. There's some vetches that work, uh, several different types of annual clovers. Uh, might even use things like red clover. It's a short lived perennial, it comes up quick though, and establishes, it does a good job of mixing <coughs> nitrogen, those types of things. Then there's some other broadleaf plants that work, some other crops like sunflower, safflower, 
Uh, they actually came out with a spineless type of a safflower that the animals will actually graze. So there's some other types of species we can use to get some forage benefit as well. There's just kind of a basic generalized the forage uh, quality comparison, getting you know, legumes, getting good protein source, kind of low to medium in fiber, good digestibility, good palatability, kind of the same with your cool season grasses, not quite as high on the protein side. Getting your warm seasons, that's where you can get your real dry matter production, but it's going to be lower in quality, higher in fiber, lower in digestibility, lower in palatability <coughs> typically. Then again, those brassicas over there. Very high in protein typically, very low in fiber, almost to the point where that becomes an issue with the animal. I'll talk about that a little bit. So with the low fiber, high digestibility, palatability, once the animals become accustomed to grazing the brassicas, there are some taste things that go along. So it takes a little bit for them to become accustomed to that taste. But once they get um, going on those, they will pretty much almost leave other things alone raise the brassicas uh, uh, specifically. So here's some things to just kind of keep in the back of your mind. There are toxicities associated with some of these uh, crops that we're talking about. Uh, the sorghums have that potential for nitrate accumulation as well as prussic acid. And uh, probably the prussic acid is more of an issue to me than the nitrates. Um, there's a lot of these mixes, you know, you may have eight, 10 different species in a cover crop mix. If one of them is sorghum sedan grass, and you want to be grazing that in that fall time period, you get that first fall frost or freeze, you have to be watching for prussic acid toxicity, pull those cows maybe for a period of time until that dissipates. Uh, sedan grass is lower in prussic acid typically, depends on the variety, so you need to watch that. Millets have the potential for nitrate accumulation, but no prussic acid production, cyanide production, so I'm a big fan of the millets in these mixes. Brassicas can accumulate nitrates if there's a lot of nitrate available in the soil. They also have these glucosinolates, can cause some thyroid type problems. That's typically more of a longer term if they're on brassicas for a long period of time and on straight brassicas. You also need to know brassicas, just a good generalized mineral mix out there. Um, it's a good idea. Again, they're low in fiber, so it's good to mix those with some of the uh, small grains, your grasses, and those types of things to provide a kind of just a readily available source of roughage in the mix as well. A hairy vetch is generally not recommended for grazing. There's some issues with uh, toxicity and kid kidney, kidney failure, photosensitization, those types of things. Uh, your black hided animals, so again, your Angus, uh, Holsteins, black hided horses, any of those would be affected more so than some of your other types of breeds. Uh, most legumes, you have to watch for the bloat potential. You want to keep them below 50% of the mix. Uh, again, mix it with some grasses or some other types of forages. Your small grains, possibly grass tetany, especially in that early growth, you know, four, five, six inches tall. Um, vegetative growth, sometimes your magnesium is too low in that. Um, Kansas State University <coughs> has a really nice fact sheet out. Uh, when all this cover crop stuff came out, they put together this fact sheet that goes through all of these types of things, talks about some of these things in general, as well as some of the specific um, uh, forages and species that you want to be concerned about and maybe you know, not include in a mix if you're gonna be grazing it. So today what I really wanted to do was go through several different studies that uh, I've been involved in the last um, six, eight years and um, just kind of give you a feel for some of the things we're doing and some of the things we've found. Again, I've been interested in the brassicas for a long time, uh, turnips and those types of things. Um, good frost potential, freeze potential, they'll grow late into that fall time period. Um, good biomass production potential to give them high quality. So they have a really high potential to extend the grazing season. And there's a lot of different species that we can choose from. I just listed a few here, the turnips, the rapes, uh, those big tillage type radishes, oil seed type radishes, the swedes or rutabagas. And then again, there's a lot of different hybrids out there. That one right there is called Postula. And that's one that we've been working with. And uh, been really impressed with that one. It comes out of New Zealand. So we did a study where we evaluated two different species or varieties of these brassicas in Fort Collins there at the research center. Uh, three different 
uh, varieties of turnips, three different varieties of rapes, uh, a kale, uh, turnip rape hybrid, which is that posture, uh, sweet or rutabaga, and then one of those big uh, tillage type uh, radishes. Two seeding dates, we seeded these in uh, mid-August as well as uh, mid-July. So this would fit like uh, an after wheat, one of the cover crop after wheat. This fit really well, with, in, at least in our environment, coming in after wheat and planting something like some of these brassicas. Two sampling dates, mid-October, mid-November, look at both yield and quality changes um, between those two different sampling periods. So here's the yield for the, the ones that were planted in mid-July and then harvested mid-October and mid-November. Irrigated, right? This is irrigated, yeah. yeah. I'll talk about a little bit of dry land work we've been doing at the end. So if we look at this, uh, all of them pretty much made about 4,000 pounds, two tons of the acre or more. Uh, some of those rapes, there's like one rape over there made uh, four tons of the acre. Is that just the tops as far as like- This is just the tops. Okay, yeah, that would the root. Yeah, I'll talk about the bulbs here in just a minute. Okay, or the ones, for the ones that do produce the bulb. Okay. So, you know, pretty good dry matter. Again, just the tops here. When we look at these uh, turnips and then this hybrid, um, we planted them back in July. That's a long time for them to grow. These are fairly short season uh, species. By the time we got between those two sampling dates in October and November, we actually lost a little bit of dry matter on those. They reached maturity basically. They had some good hard uh, frost freezes. They kind of wilted down. And so we we're beginning to lose a little bit of dry matter on those. Compared to um, the swede and the uh, uh, rape seeds and the kale over there, those continue to put on some dry matter even into that uh, November uh, time period. So this is the ones we planted in mid-August. <laughs> Kept it on the same scale, same um, y-axis over here. So you can see not near the production, right? Just planting it 30 days later. So here we were lucky to get some of them achieved a ton to the acre, 2,000 pounds there. And those were primarily the turnips. And then this hybrid again, this is the turnip rapeseed hybrid. Uh, the rapes and the uh, kale and some of those are just longer season type crops. Again, these, some of these put on a pretty significant amount of growth between that uh, mid-October and mid-November uh, sampling period. So if you need to, Get into a situation where you need to plant something a little bit later, uh, these turnips are the way to go just because of their quick growth, quick maturity, and ability to grow into that uh, fall time period. When we look at the quality, again, quality is extremely high, just average. There's some variability among some of those varieties and species, but for the most part, extremely high uh, protein. Very little change between that mid October, mid November. Sampling date, low in total fiber, 28, 27, 28%, and total NDF, which is very low in fiber, which equates to very high digestibility, so upwards of 90% digestible. So again, that can sometimes get us in a little bit of problem with uh, some animal health issues just because of that. So the other part is the ones that produce the bulbs, and uh, that's another, feed source, the animals will um, get those out of the ground, root those out of the ground if there's the, the, the bulb sticking above the ground. <clears throat> I just did a sabbatical last year in New Zealand and my thinking has changed a little bit on this. I was thinking that we needed to have small bulbs right up to my seeding rates so the bulbs would stay small. And what I they told me down there is no, you want the bulbs looking like this over here. Okay, and this is at the edge of the field where there wasn't any competition. But you get those small ones, those are the ones that are going to swallow whole, goes down the esophagus, and get stuck and choke. Okay, something bigger like that, you have to bite it and chew it, and it's not near as much of an issue with it, um, uh, getting stuck and then choking on them. So, this is a little grazing study we had. Um, this steer right here. Um, 
we turn them in and strip grays, so they turn it in the morning, they took the tops off, and then this one the guy was coming back and he was just going around picking the bulbs. He was seeking those out in the afternoon because they were kind of been pulled up and they were accessible. That top built up that was gone. So again, they get a pretty good taste for that. So here's the bulb um, uh, yields. Again, we've got October and uh, in November harvest date. And you can see that bulb growth continued on all of these going into that fall time period. <coughs> So if you think about the top growth, you know, the turnips were right around three ton um, to the acre. Uh, and then you add another, this purple top, you know, it got up over five ton to the acre of bulb growth. You add that together, that's a lot of dry matter. Okay, so bulbs are definitely another part of the feed resource that needs to be taken into account. Quality of the of the bulbs, um, they tend to be a little lower in the protein. Again, very little of any change between the two different harvest dates in October, and November. Very low in fiber, sixteen percent, and not much fiber in there at all. So digestibility is mid ninety. So again, about everything they eat is going to be digested. So again. Um, you don't have to really worry about the quality on the sandwich. Sometimes it's almost too high. Okay. So we took that data. And what I did is, I don't know why I did this, but I just kind of looked to say, well, this bar can't turn up. It, won, it was one that seemed to have really good frost tolerance, good yield potential. You know, continue to grow a little bit into that fall time period compared to some of the others. I really like this hybrid, uh, very leafy. The graduate student and I that were working on this, uh, we were sitting out there sampling. It was like, if I was a cow, which one would I want to eat? It was this one, a little ranch dressing, it would be great. The Barnopoly rape over there, again, it just kind of stood, it was easy to pick that out. And just the dry matter production on that was tremendous. And then the radish. It's not as productive as some of the others, but why would we put this radish in? The ball, but what, what's the big thing about the ball? It's what? It's the tillage part, right? It goes down foot, foot and a half. And uh, we're, we've got animals out there, and our main concern with grazing some of these is soil compaction. That's going to help to alleviate some of that soil compaction. So that's why I really like the radishes. Plus, they're, they're, they're palatable and decent dry matter production as well. All right, so we did an initial uh, grazing trial. We took that four way brassica mix, seeded it at 10 pounds to the acre, and then we seeded that 10 pounds of that brassica mix with 15 pounds of triticale, winter triticale, or winter wheat. And we really messed up, seeded way too much brassica, and it basically outcompeted those winter varieties of those cool season grasses. So we ended up with a whole field of <coughs> straight four way brassica mix. Okay. So, what, basically, what we did is we just split that up into six different grazing units, strip grazed that with 32 wheat calves for about a month. We pushed them pretty hard, probably too hard. Look at the utilization levels there, high 60s, the low 80s. Um, I think that was a, an issue. Uh, but they ate them really well. Um, after we had put dry hay out as well for them to pick from, have a little more fiber. First two or three days, they stuck pretty close to that hay. And after that, um, they nibbled on the hay a little bit, but they were pretty much eating brassicas from then on out. So, very short acclimation period to this. Weigh those calves off, and boy, I was that disappointed. I was hoping for you know, some good gains off of this, and it was zero. <coughs> Possibly a little short on crude protein. I mean, the hay was good, you know, growing steers. Um, I don't think that was probably the main issue, okay? Not enough fiber. Yeah, look at the fiber levels here. 19, 12%. Um, 
they weren't maybe eating enough hay uh, to keep that fiber, that lumen function up. But I think the big thing is, again, we pushed them a little hard, harder with those high utilization levels, and we shorted them a little bit on track. But that was the biggest issue in this one. Okay, so we kind of learn as we go. Because we had an issue with, you know, the seeding rates and the mixes that we tried for that grazing trial, we kind of went back, well, we got to figure this out. <coughs> what kind of ratio do we need to be using? What species do we need to be using? So we'd set up a little seeding rate trial. We used that brassica, four-way brassica mix at five and 10 pounds. Uh, then we had oats. You know, I've got to think of oats, you know, uh, it's going to join. Uh, it's going to get up above those brassicas, so it's not going to be the brassicas aren't going to shade them out and out feed them like they do those winter varieties of triticale and wheat and stuff. We put the winter triticale back in there. Then we went from uh, straight oats and triticale, then added uh, with the five with five pounds of that brassica mix, decreasing the amounts of the oats and the triticale. This is what we got for yields, dry matter yields. Again, no advantage to having 10 pounds of brassica seed out there. Five pounds is plenty. You may be able to cut it back a little bit uh, from there. Having the oats in there, um, added to some dry matter production compared to the winter triticale. But the yields didn't change a whole lot. When we added the brassicas with the triticale, uh, bumped us up about 500 pounds to the acre having that brassicas in there. Uh, we actually had, with the oats, the straight oats, we had the highest uh, yield there and it dropped off just a little bit uh, when we put it in there with the mix. <coughs> this might be of interest, and it was interesting to me, the field we were in was pretty clean, but where we had those oats, there was no, we, we couldn't find one weed. Okay. So again, if you're thinking organic, you guys in the organic, uh, you know, oats are a great competitor against weeds. So incorporating cover crops and cover crops that have oats in them, just a good natural weed control. Um, oats are, are really uh, competitive. Again, they get out ahead of the brassicas basically. So here, even when we only had 30 pounds of oats, five pounds of brassica, the dry matter was still made up of about 80% of the oats. And it's still a little bit too high for what I would like to see. You look at the triticale, in the winter triticale, um, the five pounds of Nebraska was about 75 pounds of triticale. We had about a 50 50 net, what I think we kind of like to see um, as far as that split between the grass and the brassica. But we can probably still cut the oats back a little bit. There's just some photos of the field, which is 100% triticale, uh, the oats and the brassica, the brassicas kind of loop down in there, the oat is cowering up above that. Um, and the triticale and the brassica, again, the brassica is basically almost smothering, covering up the triticale, so again, that's why the triticale would do quite as well. <laughs> Look at the crude protein for those mixes, again, the brassicas, very high in crude protein typically. Uh, we look over there at <coughs> the triticale mixes. Again, uh, the triticale itself was high and you mix it with the brassica, you know, not a whole lot of difference from the protein. Lower protein was um, seen in the oats. Again, 100% oats was the lowest. And then as we got more brassica into the mix, it started to bring that protein up a little bit. But again, thinking 16% plus. We're not worried about protein. It's going to meet the needs of whatever animal we have out there, Grace. This is the big one here that I'm looking for. I want more total fiber in there. Okay? And that's what the oats is going to give you. Again, not a whole lot of fiber. There's some additional fiber with the triticale, but uh, compared to the straight brassicas, but uh, not near as much as you get with, the, with having the oats. So I really like that oats, uh, brassica mix. So then we came up with another grazing trial. Um, we had eight heads that grazed straight brassica mix, that four-way brassica mix. We seeded that at 10 pounds to the acre. We didn't have quite as good a seed bed, so I upped the seeding rate a little bit on that one. Then we had 10 heads that grazed uh, the brassica plus an oat mix. That was uh, five pounds of the brassica, 
25 pounds of oak. Okay, now, Nebraska yield just a hair under uh, two tons to the acre. Nebraska plus oats gave us a little over another ton to the acre. So we're getting some fiber into that uh, mix with Nebraska, where we're getting more of the total dry matter production. Uh, this one came out with the 25 pounds of oat in there, about two thirds of the dry matter was coming from the oat and about a third from the brassica. So again, if you want more of a 50-50 mix, probably still need to cut that oat back, you know, maybe 18, 20 pounds of oats and five pounds of brassica. We ended up only grazing 22 days. We got froze out on this. So where we were grazing, we didn't have good water. We were hauling water and didn't have a way to keep the water heated. And, the ice out of it. Um, but this time around, we did a little better. Uh, Nebraska only group gained two and a half pounds a day, and Nebraska plus the oak gained two and a quarter pounds. That's more what I was hoping to, uh, to see. Here's the Nebraska oak. In Bra or the oats is up above the Nebraska's. The Nebraska's are down in there. You strip graze this, you turn them in in the morning, and uh, they went to grazing the tops off the oats, come back in the afternoon, and grazing on the Nebraska. Here's a first strip that we grazed. It's hard to see, but the brassica is kind of down in there. Here's the uh, brassica only. This is the corner of the field. Didn't get quite good take right there. But, um, got to get some snow and some good freezing temperatures on this. But when we were all said and done, we didn't, we didn't push the utilization near as high. Left a lot of good cover out there. Got some of these radishes in there. Once they decompose, they're going to leave that hole in the ground to help with that freeze thaw, fracturing of the soil, those types of things. So this came out a whole lot better than that uh, first grade of trout. We pushed them too hard. So, kind of in summary on these brassicas, again, they're high yielding, uh, quick growing crop, uh, high forage quality. You can see them in that mid to late summer time period, say after a, a <clears throat> taking off a, a wheat crop, that type of thing. Uh, if you need to go shorter season, things like the turnips work really well. 15 to 60 days from the grazing homes. Uh, we can stockpile them because they hold their quality and they're pretty freeze tolerant into that fall, early winter uh, time period. With minor changes in quality. Uh, ideally, I like to see them mixed with some kind of a grass to get that fiber up and the oats tends to work uh, pretty well for that. Uh, you need to be aware of some of the potential disorders associated with grazing brassicas, but introduce them slowly. You know, if, they're, if it's in a mix with something else and not a straight brassicas, um, provide some rough beads, trace uh, minerals, some iodized salt, um, so you don't get into the goiter problem, those types of things. In reality, any disorders associated with grazing brassicas is fairly rare. And again, we're, oftentimes we're only grazing these for maybe 30, 45 days. So we're not talking about long periods of time on the specific crops. Okay, so that's the brassicas. <clears throat> Another thing that had always intrigued me is this seeing pictures from back in the Midwest where they um, intercrop in the corn with different cool season uh, type annuals. Um, a few years ago, actually, we hired an airplane and seeded some uh, annual ryegrass and some turnips in the corn there in Fort Collins about um, first week of September just as that corn started to kind of start to dry down and the can started to open up and we got some plants to establish but they only got about this big and just little stainless things and they never really mattered any dry matter clutch at all and we just don't have enough growing season like they do back in the Midwest so I've been reading some stuff that Penn State had been doing about kind of this intercropping at about the B6 stage, six leaf stage on the corn, just about the point where you can still get a tractor over it, but uh, just before that, can that, uh, you know, that canopy closes. Uh, they got some nice grants to buy and build some uh, these nice interseeders, uh, you know, do some tillage and you can put herbicides and fertilizers and all kinds of things down with these. Um, I'm, I work for CSU, a little more low budget. Um, I have this 10-foot uh, toolbar and this gandy box uh, cedar set in the shed. I had a bunch of uh, baby blade coulters and 
And so I just set my own little toolbar up, um, jammed three of those coulters about as close as I could get them, fit between the corn rows, about six and a half, seven inches apart. And I just used this dandy box, plugged a bunch of the holes, and just ran three tubes down in, uh, seat three rows at a time. And this is just plot scale type stuff. Here's what we seeded. Um, again, reading the Penn State stuff, they've been using annual ryegrass and crimson clover and been having really good success with that as a mix. So we see it's an annual ryegrass by itself, some crimson clover by itself, and then a mix kind of like they were using. I used my famous brassica, like full lay brassica cocktail, 10 pounds to the acre, some Leonard Triticale, and then brassica cocktail mixed with the Leonard Triticale. So we seeded that in the late June. This is what the annual ryegrass looked like in the end of July. What it looked like at the end of uh, September, getting some nice, good uh, green growth down there. You know, the corn's drying down, we're getting that light back down in that canopy, and we're starting to get some growth on those things that we seeded. Uh, the brassica cocktail, it was doing uh, really well for us. <coughs> this was just amazing me is when you know we pulled through at the end of the field, and so we had all these uh, different things that we had seeded. And where there was no competition, I mean, there's a lot of production there. You just walk a foot into the corn canopy there, and it's like it goes from you know here to hardly anything, just because of that light competition that's going on down there. Here's what it looked like towards the end of um, October. You cut the corn off of it, and you can see these nice green strips down there. The annual ryegrass <coughs> is doing really well. Doing that rascal cocktail did really well for us. We took uh, dry matter um, yields on those, and um, I mean, it wasn't tremendously impressive. You know, a little over 500 pounds to the acre of the annual ryegrass, close to 700 pounds to the acre of the Alaska cocktail. Again, crimson clover may do well in Pennsylvania, it doesn't do well here. Um, this mix, again, it was primarily annual ryegrass, and it just lower yielding because we see it at a lower. Uh, the winter triticale. Uh, with my setup, we didn't get good seed to soil contact. So I think if we had a better setup, it might do a little better. Again, the mix over there with the brassicas, that's kind of the brassicas, just a little bit of winter triticale. But even this, if you think about it, when we graze corn stalks, post corn stover, Good energy content there. And this is the total plant here 4.9% crude protein. That includes the stalks and the leaves and the cobs and everything. You know, that's not going to meet the requirements, but the animal's going to hydrate corn stove. They're going to eat the cobs and the, any grain that's out there. They're going to eat the leaves first. But if you have, you know, five, 700 pounds to the acre of that nice green cool season out there, that's you know 17, 18, 24% crude protein. They don't need a whole lot of that to offset basically as a, as a supplement. That's what I'm looking at this as a supplement, protein supplement. Uh, for those animals grazing on you know, corn stovers, you don't have to worry about protein supplementation, you know, alfalfa or whatever else you might be supplementing. And we've done a little bit of economic on this and you know. Just compared to the feeding alfalfa hay as a, as a protein supplement, and uh, depends on what the price of the alfalfa is, but we could actually make this pencil out even with those uh, yield levels that we had. So here's what it looked like after the first, you know, good hard freeze and a little bit of snow on it. It kind of <coughs> melts it down just a little bit, but again, if you strip graze this and have some uh, animals out there, they're going to find that nice green stuff that's still kind of done. I was, I think we need to do some more work on this. I haven't had money and time to do that, but I think it's a, a good option. So, I wanted to just finish up today on some more. So, all of that was irrigated uh, under pivot irrigation. Um, we've also been doing some work out in eastern Colorado, western Kansas, and the southwest corner of Nebraska on dryland cover crops. 
You know, there's this big push to use cover crops. And it's like, when you're in a dry land situation, if you put a, a cover in there, what happens when you come to put in your wheat crop or your corn crop, whatever that cash crop is? What happens to your yields and stuff um, following? And so our thought is, is if you're gonna use cover crops in dry land situations, grazing almost has to be a part of the system to capitalize because you more than likely you're going to lose <coughs> some yield potential at least initially going into these systems um, on that cash crop okay but if we can gain some benefit by offsetting some feed costs for livestock or you know, lease out cover crops to the, to the neighbor or whatever that might be it gets an economic advantage to pay for that putting that cover crop in so we've been working, this has all been pretty much on-farm type stuff. Uh, this was a guy over in um, kind of the northwest uh, uh, part of uh, Kansas there. Uh, these were spring planted cover crops. <coughs> so following it was uh, typically corn or sunflowers the year before, uh, coming in with these cover crops in the spring, uh, mostly cool season, I'll go over the mix here a little bit. Uh, this is what it looked like when the cows went on a month later. Everything had joined it and was heading and seeding out. Uh, we grazed these and um, kind of divided the field into quarters basically and grazed each quarter for about uh, oh, five to seven days, about seven days generally. Well, this is like the first quarter that we grazed and it, it set those grasses back quite a bit, those cool season grasses, and allowed that rape seed to come on as well as some of the uh, field peas to come on. Um, he didn't go back and regraze this, but if it would have been mine, I probably would have gone back and at least lightly grazed that. 2016 was a really good precip year, so uh, got a lot of good regrowth on this. And you still want to leave some residual out there for your soil health benefits, but there was a lot of good feed here that could have been taken advantage of. <clears throat> so 2016, in the spring was pretty wet, so that guy got planted back in March. These guys didn't get out in the field early enough, and so then they got it was too wet to get out and get planted. They didn't get planted until the first part of May. And so he, he didn't graze until uh, July into early August. And so these mixes that got planted later and grazed later, we had both cool season and warm season species in the mix. Those ones that planted early back in March, there was hardly any of the warm season that uh, showed itself. But in these mixes that were planted in May and then grazed in that July time period, you can see the sunflowers out there. Uh, we had some millet, different things, some of the other uh, warm seasons that came up. So these were a lot more diverse type of a mix. This was an eight-way um, mix of different species. So the mix was, uh, we had some oats and barley, we had sunflower, a rapeseed, uh, some peas, a little bit of flax, safflower, and then and the millet. Again, the millet, uh, safflower, and the sunflower have been all the warm seasons in that mix. So these bars um, in the fields, we had some ungrazed. We fenced out some areas and kept them ungrazed. Um, so we can collect a little bit of data on that. So the first bar is the grazed and ungrazed for a particular uh, farmer. So the first three here got planted early back in that March uh, time period. Um, this was in Southwest Kansas here, this guy. So he was a little drier down there. So he didn't get the regrowth, like a lot of the other guys did. But if you look at the difference here between the grazed and the ungrazed, um, there's not a whole lot of difference. Okay? And that was due to again, a good moisture year and good regrowth on what was grazed early by the time we <coughs> came back and we sampled and we averaged across all four of those uh, reps, um, not a whole lot of difference. Now, one thing that we did notice, um, you got these cool season the annual grasses in here, the barley and the oats. That's what tended to dominate the mixes. They weren't seeded at extremely high rates. I mean, they were, you know, 10 to 15 pounds to the acre is all we had, but they tended to dominate the mixes. You know, sometimes it was the oats a little more, or sometimes it was the barley a little more. Again, these guys got planted back in that uh, early May time period. It became a little more diverse mix. They also had a lot more weed. This top part of the bar, this gray part of the bar, that's the weeds. So they had more issues with weeds compared to the guys that got planted early. Again, another 
potential things to keep in your mind for organic production. But again, we have a lot more vanilla, um, sunflowers, and those types of things in those uh, mixes that got planted later. But again, dry land, we were close to two tons of the acre in most sites. We thought that was pretty good. So kind of, kind of our take home here is if you're gonna plant early, there's really no need to put warm seasons in the mix. You can plant back in March. Uh, those warm seasons just a waste of money. They're not gonna compete. Those cool seasons are gonna come up. You're gonna outcompete all those warm seasons. So it's kind of a waste of money. If you're gonna plant you know, kind of from that May on through the rest of the summer, cool season, warm season mixes tend to make sense. <clears throat> and again, it's something else that we've noticed, I've done some other stuff. Many of those legumes and forbs that are in a lot of these mixes, uh, they just don't compete well. And a lot of those are fairly expensive. So again, you have to kind of be thinking about diversity of the mix versus the expense of the mix. And by, you, know, you may only be putting <coughs> less than a pound in the mix, but you know, if it's $30 a pound or something for some of these, uh, different species, you know, is it worth it? Because it, you may only get a few plants out there. Those kind of things. So, just some things to kind of think about. We looked at the gains. Um, this is the first you guy, first picture that I showed you in northwest Kansas. He grazed with 108 steers, and uh, we were pleasantly surprised with the gains we got off of that. Now, um, you have to realize that these are not all, these are not shrunk weights. Just, you know, <coughs> we're working with the producers, you can't really always do those you know, 12 hour shrink or whatever it might be. So there might be some fill issues going on here, but again, with 108 head, I'm pretty confident that we had good gains. So they look good. Steers look big coming on. <coughs> uh, this guy here, um, this is the overall average, is about two and a half pounds. Um, he implanted about half of the steers and half of them he left uh, unimplanted, so about three tenths of a gain, down to day gain. Uh, we needed that implant, uh, but again, two and a half pounds a day, uh, those are all more than acceptable on this type of dry land type forage. So the guys that got planted late in that um, May time period, um, they got into the mid part of the summer, early July, when they first started to graze. Now, this guy's looked really good when he first went in, but by the time they came out in early uh, August, uh, everything had pretty much you know, dried up, things gone dormant, browned off. So <coughs> quite a bit less um, ADG on these, you know, 1.4, 1.2 pounds a day. Um, but still, you know, it's it's feed, it's a positive uh, gain. So um, you know, just gonna be differences on when you graze them, what species are out there, what the environmental conditions are, those types of things. So we've also been doing some post wheat. So those were spring planted, so we'll come in as soon after we get the wheat crop off as possible. This is the mix we've been using there. Uh, triticale, sorghum sudan, foxtail millet, some sunflower, rapeseed, one of the big radishes, uh, Austrian winter peas, and some cow peas. <coughs> so this was a guy in Eastern Colorado back in 2017. He got in there, had some uh, nice rains, <coughs> we got it seeded, and everything went really nice. Peas climbing up to uh, sunflower and sorghum plants here. He grazed that with 87 head of heifers, about 40 acres for about 45 days. Um, I was a little disappointed in his ADG here. I just the way the forage looked, I thought it would be a little better than that. Um, and I talked about the toxicity issues, okay? <laughs> he actually ended up having to pull those in, in October here because of the sorghum sedan. He had a good hard freeze, prussic acid in the sorghum. And so he had to pull them for seven to ten days until that um, prussic acid dissipated. So, again, it's something to be thinking about when you're putting these mixes together, and especially with those sorghums. It's not the first time I've heard that's had to do that something to keep in the back of your mind. All right, so this is one in eastern Colorado out towards the Kansas line. 
um, 93 acres. <coughs> he got 57 days of grazing out of this, 31 head of steers, two pounds, 80 G. When I, when I look at this compared to that previous slides, it's like, how did you get two pounds of ADG that <coughs> And it was that same mix. Primarily what took was the foxtail millet, a little bit of sorghum sedan grass, and a triticale plant here and there. Again, this was post-wheat, and this was a wheat field that got hailed out, so there was a little bit of volunteer wheat down in there. A little bit of green, not a whole lot. Primarily this foxtail millet. We're gaining two pounds a day on it. I weigh these on and off, and those cows look good. Look good. When we were out there sampling, I was looking at the manure piles. Okay. One thing you don't see anything of is the seed head on the foxtail millet. The manure was just packed with foxtail millet seed. So they were going around picking every foxtail millet that's head off of there. And I think that's why you know, good carbs in there, good energy. I think that's why we were seeing ADGs up there on two pounds. This was being raised in December, January, and February. First time we moved you up there. You think the stocking rate had anything to do with that? The stocking rate, uh, you know, it's a light stocking rate. It didn't push it very hard. There was still good cover, good foliage there. Pull them out. Yeah, push them harder. Yep, yep. Push them harder. Yep, yep. Makes a big difference. All right, just some things to kind of conclude here. Thinking about spring plant cover crops. Uh, start early. When that forage gets to about six to eight inches. Doesn't look like there's a whole lot out there, but I guarantee you if you wait too much longer, it's going to get ahead of you. Okay? The stuff just happens so quick in the spring, especially with those. Uh, uh, cool season uh, small grades. Uh, we've been getting about 30 days on average. Sometimes we can push that up to 45, but again, we just everything joints and, and matures so quickly uh, that the cows basically go off feed. You just try to push them too hard onto that stemmy, stocky stuff. Matures. Now, if we plant a little later, again, post weed or even in like that May, those guys got planted in May that one year. We can stockpile that for later grazing, works pretty well. Um, graze it into that fall, early winter time period, and just realizing the quality is gonna decline over time. But again, it doesn't always manifest in the four games. So here's uh, just an example of, you know, here's early May. This is one of our Southwest Kansas producers. He didn't start grazing until the 25th of May. Probably should have been grazing more back towards here. And about a week later, you couldn't even see the calves out there. <laughs> so things just mature very quickly. And that's one of the real challenges, especially with these spring planted cover crops, with these uh, cool season tax species. They're just, you know, they're just programmed. Once we get some growing degree days there, they're gonna join, they're gonna mature and set that seed, and they're pretty much done. So forage quality drops off. So what we found on these dry land cover crops is uh, rotational grazing works pretty well. You don't have to get real intensive on it. Moving every five to seven days seems to be more than, than adequate. You can use strip grazing to allow back grazing on that. That's going to result in some heavier utilization as well as trampling of the forage, can be positive or negative depending on what you're trying to accomplish. This works really well if you only have maybe one water source or limited water sources. Uh, they can go back to that water source. <laughs> Your goal is really should be about 30 to 50 percent utilization. It's not going to be as high as if um, you're strictly looking at forage production, livestock uh, gain on this. Um, you need to leave for your soil health benefits approximately a thousand pounds per acre minimum. Most importantly, about 30 percent ground cover. So just final thoughts here, Again, what's your main goal here? Some guys may really be pushing the, the forage and livestock production part of it. And soil health may be secondary. Some guys may be looking totally at soil health and forage livestock production is uh, uh, secondary. So if you, each one of you is going to be different based on your own um, uh, goals and objectives. 
you know, how do the cover crop fit into your overall cropping system? Not just that particular field. We run into issues with crop insurance restrictions. You know, that has set termination dates and things on some of these cover crops. You have to be terminated a certain number of days before that cash crop goes in, those types of things. What's your climatic and irrigation limitations in you know, the dry land? Um, in, in thinking about potential impacts on the following cash crop. <clears throat> Probably is going to, at least in our environment, there's going to be an impact. Uh, do mixtures or monocultures fit your needs best? Can impact on seed costs? And some of those uh, lesser known species are very expensive or really going to contribute to, to much, those types of things. You can always be thinking about those potential toxicities, and things like that, sorghum sedan and the prussic acid issue. So, with that, I think we've got a few minutes, not much, but a few minutes for any questions. Uh, sure. So, just on a couple questions about those dry land cover crop. When you came in after the wheat harvest and planted uh, late <coughs> summer, uh, did you still allow for that uh, full fallow and go back into winter wheat that next, you know, uh, August, September? Or, uh, so, so they were coming in right after the wheat harvest yep. taken off. They planted their cover crop. Cover crop will be terminated that next spring, typically. Yep. And then they're you know, typically going back into like corners. In in that following in that following year. Okay. All right. And then uh, for your spring spring covered crops, you're just planting it in, grazing it off. Now that would typically go back into winter wheat in the fall. In the fall. Okay. Cool. That's yeah. how most of the guys were in that case. Okay. You ever try the mango beets, the porridge beets? Uh, no, I haven't. Those are recommended to me as uh, planting for cakes. Yeah, I just like I said, I just got back from New Zealand last year, last uh, winter, and uh, the beets are really big down there for dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, They're tremendous amount of dry matter production potential, but. You have to be so careful with the luminance in where you have to wean them on, you almost have to wean them off. Mm. They, they take like two to three weeks to wean them on to the, the beans. Just because they're so high in sugar and digestibility, problems with acidosis. Now, the pigs, I'm not sure <coughs> they're, they're not yet to call it well. It seems like it's hard. So. <laughs> in, in our experience, it's okay. I, guess, I don't know if that's true. So, obviously, you did a lot of these trials with cropland, right? Um, what's, what do you think of the possibilities of doing cover crops, no tilling to like an existing pasture as a, you know, to balance out like cool season grasses with a warm season cover crop mix or vice versa? I've messed with that a little bit, and I've never had any. Can't get the establishment interceding. No, I think mean, you can get it to come up, but it just it, it just can't ever compete against what's already established there. You have to almost, you know, like in our environment, a lot of it's cool season, and trying to get you know warm season into that, or I mean, it just the timing is not quite right. Plants are still trying to grow, and they're still able to compete. It's not like some of the other parts of the country where, you know, like Louisiana, they, you know, they'll go into their Bermuda grass that's gone dormant with cool season annuals or something. And they can graze pretty much all season long, all year long. But the Bermuda grass has pretty much kind of gone dormant by the time they pick a cool season annual. So that works pretty well. I'd like to make it work. Like where my husband is wanting to do something like that, like what he was saying. Only this is the Midwest, I can't think of where we're a little bit longer, maybe growing season, but uh, yeah. Maybe enough difference. All you can do is try. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't go whole whole hog. Yeah, well, what I was doing is we're doing a lot of smooth from grass. Obviously, once you kind of graze it, it's pretty much done, especially if you get it dry season. So, it's, you know, I don't know if there's a possibility of something like that or. <laughs> that risk that year you might have to do something for that fall. 
Yeah, I never tried anything from grown grass. Yeah, it goes through that summer slump pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, is it irrigator or dry? Great. <clears throat> I would think it's still going to be pretty minimal production for that was Do you think that grass at the next move? Did you till that? Did you plant with drill? Did you blow it on and throw it in? How did you do it? Uh, when we did the straight brassica variety species evaluation, that was drilled in with this drill. Um, like I say, when I was seeded into that corn, you know, I just ran those lady blade cultures and we just dribbled seed behind the lady blade cultures. So that was basically almost broadcast into a left up turn. And it came up fine. Like I say, I, a lot of guys fly brassicas on the corn and stuff, you know. It's, it's one of them that will work. So that's the other advantage to, like I said, ryegrass, annual ryegrass, any of the ryegrasses, that's the advantage of ryegrass. You can put the seed on the surface as long as it's wet for about four or five days. Uh, it'll get that root down into the soil and survive. Or a few grasses that it leaves. Uh, just off of that question, you mentioned like, having a sort of shift in opinions about the bulb size. Um, so is that seeding? Like, would that be a shift in seeding rate to get larger than the size yeah. or a timing piece? Or what would you recommend for that kind of looking back on it? Seeding rate, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in New Zealand, they seed two to three pounds. Okay. So they're lower. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> like I said, my, my thought process is just kind of backwards. I'm going to up this seed rate so I get these bulbs that yeah. are smaller. Well, I've heard people sometimes complain about the rut, like kind of the rust from big bulbs. I don't know. Like what the complaint is about them, like what the challenge is. Well, just the it makes it very rough. Once yeah. the ball's gone, it needs that indication. That's desired for hip compaction. It's very desired. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, that's why I really like those big radishes. They do want that hole in here. Sometimes they get three inches in diameter, so the surface there is pretty huge. That's why I spent the angle groups in the public picture of the massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it called? Mango? M-A-N-G-E-L. Oh, okay. You're like, <laughs> 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 I don't know how the cows actually eat them. Yeah, I guess that's a good idea. Eggs are the mine. But they do. I mean, I've, I've seen videos and pictures. I mean, they'll, they'll just slip the field up. They'll get everyone on the ground. And, I mean, that's a little different beef, but the actual fodder beef that they're using in this case, or as that way, if they were using cash. Based on the tree, we done any more this morning? Uh, Just out of curiosity, with doing this, um, are you seeing any major differences in the soil um, as far as that organic matter and the nutrients available? I'm the forage specialist. <laughs> so I, I haven't done as much on the soil, but, and we haven't we haven't been able to do it in a, the same area for long enough. You know, the soil health and the changes in the soil health that's more than a two year deal. You know, that's the issue. It needs to be more of a longer term study when we're doing this. We cover the top stuff on the same area for. Yeah, I, I think it's I mean I think it's happening. You know, we used to really like to try to make it or I have a Yeah, we've got you know leaving back behind a fair amount of dry matter and you know, like Nebraska that could degrade quickly. It's got to be how much residue are you getting to leave behind the leaves? Well, well I'd say minimum of about a thousand pounds. In many cases, we'll leave more than that. Especially under those dry land situations. I think it's a bad impact in prior uh, following yields. No. Yeah, there's some other my colleagues that have looked at that. But there has been a good impact. Possibly? No. 
under the dry land. Right. Right. I see. Yeah. Irrigated is not a good water. Right. There, there's a lot of positive things, but you know, back in the Midwest, with high rainfall, there's some positive things. Corn, soybeans, and all that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.